we are bringing key takeaways from the Mobilized Learning Lab, a community comprised of researchers, experts, and partners from ITDP and the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations. We have been looking into the challenges and solutions through the intersection of research and practice, together forging an inquiry into this theme. If this is your first time hearing about Mobilized Learning Lab, don't worry. We'll share key takeaways from the program and you can also see what we have been up to over the course of, of the year in the link that I will share in the chat with you. Our panel includes three experts who will talk about the public transport um, experience in their city through three lenses, equity, funding and financing, um, and resiliency and will bring some of the researchers from the program to unpack a little bit deeper these themes um, and also the way of moving forward. These learnings will be packaged into a white paper that we'll share uh, with you around uh, mid-December. So we're really excited to share all the learnings uh, from discussions and deep dives um, that we had over the course of the year. Um, so it's time to introduce uh, today's speakers. We'll first hear uh, a brief welcome from Henrik Nolmark, VRF's director. Then we'll pass it to session moderator, Jacob Mason, director of research and impact at ITDP Global to share a brief synthesis of the activities with the community and some key takeaways. Then we'll Q and the panel. We'll first um, start with um, Bernardo Serra, Policy and Climate Change Manager from ITDP Brazil, who will bring perspective um, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Fanu Kalugendo, Director of Transport Development at Dar es Salaam Rapid Transit, to share some reflections on the BRT system in the city. And then finally, Sanjay Kumar Biswal, General Manager for Operations and, and Maintenance at the Capital Region Urban Transport in Bhubaneswar. Uh, to bring the perspective of the city's transport system. Um, also, we welcome four researchers who are engaged with the cities um, to dive a little bit deeper into some of, this, uh, of these topics and things that interest them to un unpack a little bit more. We have with us Winnie Mitula, policy and government coordination expert, who is a professor um, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Then Gina Porter, who leads research around gender and access, who is a professor um, at Durham University, UK. Um, Ricardo Giesen, a transport specialist, who is a director of BRT uh, Plus Center of Excellence. And then Gift Dumeda, who looks at the intersection of um, services and informality. He is an associate professor um, and senior fellow at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. Um, I, how, I hope I got everyone, um, everyone's names and everyone's uh, roles all right. And just wanted to ask everyone to say quick hello to the audience. Hello. Hello, there. <laughs> everyone. Hello everyone. Perfect. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, I am very happy to welcome Henrik Nolmark to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, I, I was looking at the numbers and I, I, I saw that we'd uh, reached 200 participants just before I uh, got the word. Uh, that's fantastic. So I'm Henrik Nolmark of BREF, director at BREF, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of VREF to, to this uh, uh, wrapping up final session of the Mobilized Learning Lab 2023, 20, uh, sorry, 2022, 2023. Uh, it's great uh, to have this uh, cooperation with ITDP, and it's really fantastic to see all of you. It's, uh, it's a very international event today, um, and um, it's a, of course, it's a very international uh, topic or, or theme. Uh, public transportation is really the backbone of uh, sustainable mobility uh, around the globe, uh, not just in cities, by the way, also in uh, rural areas. Uh, it's we, We're struggling with public transportation uh, to get that um, happening. Uh, but uh, I won't be speaking long. I just wanted to say hello and uh, looking forward so much to this event. We have a very rich uh, panel. And I also want to mention again the 
the the paper that is coming. Uh, we will hear some summaries from the paper, uh, but it is really worthwhile uh, actually reading the paper yourself, uh, which is um, maybe takes an hour or two, but uh, I can recommend it. It's, it summarizes a lot of what has been said in the in the online events, but also in Bogota. Uh, from VRF, we have uh, Vanessa Duarte here, uh, and we have Karin Hendrickson here. Some of you met Karin and, and Vanessa in Bogota, and you've met in the previous sessions. I think also Jane Summerton is here, our scientific advisor at VRF. I don't see Jane on my screen, but I think I saw you in the list of participants. So I think with that, um, I welcome you all, and I wish all of us a very fruitful and rewarding uh, two hours, or well, maybe 1.50 or so left. Um, come back later. So maybe I, do I hand over to Jacob, or do you want to say something, I wanna? No, that's that's wonderful. And uh, we'll spend about, um, well, the session is 75 minutes, but we have about um, a little bit over an hour. So let's get to it. And thank you so much, Henrik, again. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Jacob. Thank you, Ivona, and thank you, Henrik. Um, as both of you mentioned, this is a culmination of almost two years of engagement between uh, this research network, ITDP, uh, our Lighthouse Cities, as well as um, partners and staff from both organizations. We re really wanna thank VREF for their support in this effort. And uh, a big thank you to everyone who has participated in this discussions. This is a, a learning from people around the world um, and all of these different perspectives are, are so useful to improving our understanding um, of this topic of public transportation. And thank you to everyone here who's joining this discussion. Um, this continues the conversation and continues to build our, our learning. Um, a lot of really smart and thoughtful people. Um, so we developed this learning lab, a community um, to inquire about the future of public transportation, public transport. Um, we saw an urgency to do this, especially coming out of the pandemic where we saw big declines in public transport ridership um, and in some places declining subsidies and support for public transport. Um, and these challenges seemed even more grim when they were combined with other challenges like climate change, conflicts, budget deficits, equity issues, and changing uh, mobility and urban development trends, um, some of which were related to uh, the pandemic. So the intersection of this research and practice allowed us to, to learn and see things from the knowledge and practice perspective, bringing together people who were doing research, people who were involved with implementation to understand what we know and what we should explore further. So I wanna to get to some of the challenges and solutions we found um, in this effort. And really we, we looked at three themes for the program. We looked at equity, we looked at funding and financing and resilience at, as key places for continued engagement. Um, so through the, the deep dive discussions, um, we, we really developed these um, topics. And then we traveled to Bogota, Colombia this past summer uh, to learn firsthand from the experience in Bogota, um, from the people on the ground working on public transport um, and to understand what they found uh, in their development in their pursuit of resilient, equitable transport. And so we found a number of good practices there, such as government support for public transport, um, through a coordination between departments. So we saw a collaboration between the Secretariat of Women and the Mobility Secretariat, um, and the Mobility Secretariat, which is focused on bolstering the outcomes for people and the resilience of the city. Uh, we also saw a focus on gender benefits. Um, we saw the, the La Rolita Publica bus system, uh, which helped enable women's participation in the, the transport workforce. We saw a bus company that had more than half of their drivers uh, were women. Um, and that was combined with care blocks, which was an approach to integrating land use and mobility to bring services around public transport stations um, at, and locating those services at, at public transport service uh, stations so that caregivers and women uh, can access them in, as part of their transportation uh, and movement around the city. We saw climate solutions like bus electrification and the expansion of the cycling network to improve first and last mile connectivity and support clean modes of transportation, of transport. 
We saw better integration between walking, cycling, and public transport to help people shift uh, from a uh, motorized mobility uh, and a car-based mobility into a more integrated, sustainable network of, of uh, transport. And finally, we saw how road safety initiatives and investment in walking and cycling uh, can really support um, better and more sustainable transport um, founded on a, a backbone of public transport. So maybe I'll pass it back to Ivona to play a video. gris del siglo XX para tener las vías y la ciudad y la productividad y el cuidado del siglo XXI. great so we we had a ride on the BRT this morning so we we're able to see the high capacity stations and passing lanes and the express services so that was a lot of fun and then the integration with the cable car so it's been a good visit we're learning a lot from Bogota Mi nombre es Jamie Galindo, conductora de la rolita. Bienvenidos a Bogotá. Thanks, Ivana. Um, and that video really highlights some of the the many elements uh, in Bogotá that we saw and the this results of sustained investment. Um, and prioritization of, of walking, cycling, and, and public transport, especially in that city. Um, and, and from a personal note, it showed the changes possible um, in a fairly short amount of time. Um, so I just want to keep going and wrap up my comments, and then we can get to the discussion from everyone else. Um, so I'll just say that we also held a round table looking at the link between walking and public transport and that was held after Bogota. Um, and that highlighted the importance of walking, which is one of the most fundamental forms of transport. Um, we found similar linkages between equity, resilience, and funding and financing. Um, walking, as I'm sure you all know, is already a, a major mode of transport, especially in many low and middle income countries. And we really encourage governments to build on this foundation and invest in uh, walking infrastructure. Uh, to enhance and support walking going forward. Um, and this will improve access to public transport and local services and provide a, a critical link between land use and transport planning. Uh, so based on these roundtables, discussions, and the study tour, uh, we developed a few key takeaways that I want to share. Um, the biggest takeaway is that the future of public transport is equitable, it's resilient, and it's well-funded. So I'll just dig into a few of those. Um, public transport is a public service, and as such, it needs public investment and public oversight. Uh, all public transport needs to be well-funded and financed, including informal public transport. And so with adequate investment, we can achieve good service for all, and this includes improving what are currently informal services. Good service is the bedrock for a resilient and sustainable public transport system. And this means having a diversity of options within the public transport systems that are connected and integrated. Um, public, public participation 
uh, and community building are essential to creating those resilient, sustainable, and equitable public transport systems so that the services address the needs of the people that use it. Um, disaggregated data and digitalization can be powerful tools to help us create those systems. Uh, but we need to be careful about collecting data that's reflective of everyone and using that data to, to plan carefully. We also found that land use planning and policy have to go hand in hand with transport planning and policy. Public transport to be, for public transport to be a backbone and connector for the city, uh, land use planning and policy has to support the public transport planning. Um, there are still a lot of challenges. Balancing the long-term and short-term planning needs uh, is, is difficult, um, but we can look to leveraging policies and linking transport planning with other social goods, like creating more social capital and boosting inclusion and equity in other areas of social life. Um, funding and financing of public transport is expensive. Um, but there are low cost, high impact interventions that we can uh, pursue. Um, and improving first and last mile connectivity is a major opportunity for improving public transport. Um, so we need cities to create concrete actions to support public transport. Um, and I'm really excited to hear from the three cities about um, what they've been doing uh, on public transport to support uh, equity, climate, and funding and financing. So the three cities we're going to hear from, uh, as Ivona mentioned, are Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Bhubaneswar, India. So first, uh, I'm pleased to invite uh, Bernardo Serra to, to give um, some remarks uh, from the perspective of Rio de Janeiro. So I'll pass it to you, Bernardo. Thank you, Jacob. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ivona and Enric. It's a pleasure to be to be here back speaking on behalf of uh, ITDP after uh, two years and a half working as the uh, Transport Undersecretary of Rio. And I'm really glad to share a little bit more about our experience in the past years. So first of all, I think it's important to, to everyone to, to, to know that Rio is the second largest city in Brazil with over uh, 6 million residents in the city, city limits. Uh, and it is also the heart of a metropolitan area with uh, more than 12 million people. So as such, the city is a hub of economic services, uh, cultural and social activities. It attracts over 2 million people each day in the city. And the public transport, it, it's really a backbone here. So it represents over 40% of all daily trips in the metropolitan area. Um, the, this, the, the, the sad, sad side of the story is that despite substantial investments in, in, in the system, in the infrastructure in the past decades, which included the construction of three bus rapid transit uh, corridors spanning over 150 kilometers. We, we were facing a decline in the demand even before the pandem pandemic and obviously, obviously it got worse after it. Uh, the BRT system serves may, has the main illustrative example of the challenges that we faced. So in 2017, the system had a fleet of uh, over 250 articulated buses operating. And by 2021, the city opted, when the city opted for a second intervention in the system, uh, this number had dropped to just 120 buses. Besides the third part of the conventional buses lines were opera operating uh, below the demand needs, over five, 600 bus stops were uh, unserved by any line in the city, leaving numerous uh, multiple neighborhoods disconnected from the essential public service transport of transportation. The state of, obviously was a result of a complex set of factors, including um, a huge regional and, and national economic and political crisis. But this problem became more, even more pronounced when faced with this discrete decrease in demand 
in its heating uh, vicious, vicious cycle of fair hikes to cover costs resulting in accelerated decline in public transport usage and also leading uh, that, that, that also led to a degradation in service quality and its competitiveness against uh, the other alternatives. At this moment in 2021, the, the city didn't have the necessary instrument to address this challenge, uh, mainly because uh, of uh, a contractual uh, arrangement in which the public essential service were following um, a restricted private remuneration scheme. The regional design of this contract consolidated all the elements of the public transport in, in the hands of a single uh, groups, a group of private operators. So the contract consolidated depot, fare collection, buses, data, operation, all was under the control of uh, a set, a group of, of private operators that were in part also involved in the multiple corruption accusation in precedent in precedenting years. And in 2001, uh, 2021, sorry, uh, the mayor Eduardo Paz assumed the office. Uh, he was the mayor responsible for the implementation, implementation of the BRT system uh, in the past decade. And he um, enlisted uh, Maina Celidonia, who was a young woman with a robust academic background to lead the transport secretary and also appointed Claudia Cecin as the uh, executive to lead the intervention and the operation of the BRT system. And what he did, what the administration did was to resume, uh, first of all, all the investment in infrastructure. So we had to refurbish terminals, stations, um, BRT lanes, uh, and also resume the, the construction of the BRT, uh, the tr Trans Brazil BRT corridor. Uh, under the leadership of Maina, the municipality also started a comprehensive reform of the public transportation governance. And the pivotal and the first and pivotal aspect was uh, separating the fleet provision from a private operator for the BRC system. As part of it, the city uh, acquired uh, over 600 buses for the BRC system more or less half of it is already operating and the second half will be operating by April 2024. And this infusion of new buses coupled with uh, improvement in service quality has led to uh, a remarkable increase in demand exceeding 50% uh, uh, of increasing uh, in the BRT uh, system demand. Uh, in the in in couple of couple of months. Additionally, the the municipality also undertook the separation of fare collection system from the control of private operators, uh, which was a, a strategic move not only to enhance transparency but also to facilitate better access to data, um, in order to enable uh, more price price size planning and create a fair integration uh, fair integration incentives should be um, implemented uh, over uh, the next year. And we had uh, a judicial agreement uh, with uh, public operators and also representative from the public attorney office, uh, which enabled uh, us to implement a subsidy uh, scheme for the conventional bus system uh, and to recuperate, recover uh, its operation. So we we were able to eliminate transport deserts in various neighborhoods, ensuring that uh, 600 bus stops which had been left uh, uncovered were once again included in the, in the system, marking a, a substantial improvement in accessibility and connectivity for residents across the city. Um, and one of the crucial steps of it was the, dis the digitalization process of all the data uh, available uh, in the in the secretary, um, and I, I, I'm glad to speak a little bit more uh, about it uh, afterwards. But uh, uh, I don't I don't want to go too deep in everyone uh, every every one of these points, but because uh, uh, I, I think we we will have a little bit of time for uh, of, to do so in the discussion. But 
I, I, I want to leave some K next steps, K way forward that we still have to progress here. Uh, so, uh, and I will highlight five, four points for this moment. I think the first one is we have an existing uh, subsid subsidy system that is reliant on the municipal budget. And therefore it's vulnerable uh, uh, because it doesn't have a clear uh, and sustainable revenue stream. So we have this risk of potential influence of political priorities for the next uh, years uh, to come. And one of the key steps and one of the key discussion that we, we are having in this in Brazilian city is how we can have more coordination and more participation from the federal uh, budget to support the subsidy at the, at the, at the city, city level. A second point that I would like to point out, and this is also related to the coordination and support from for an other uh, level of government, is, is the challenge to, to keep uh, the, the fleet renewal that started uh, in this administration. And it, it is imperative for keeping improving, uh, improve, keeping the improvement of, of service quantities. So we have now private operators that are still dealing with deficit from previous years and they don't have the the, the capital to to progress in the investment for this fleet, fleet renewal uh, and despite the urgency uh, for uh, tackling climate change progress in discarbonization for the fleet was not made yet uh, in the city so this is something that we should uh, solve in the in the next couple of years and um, also we have Two other points I would like to point out. First of all, it's, we still have to en enhance the coordination with state level. We we are here a city in the in the heart of a metropolitan area that have really poor practice of coordination with the the metropolitan services and and the Trans Brazil BRT corridor uh, is a, a key uh, corridor that we should uh, enhance this, this type of co coordination. And at least the regulation of other service, uh, transport services. So the city don't have yet a uh, regulation for transport network companies, or even uh, are facing some challenges in, in re regulating informal uh, and pirate transit. So it remains a, a substantial challenge uh, to have a unique and integrated uh, service uh, and transport network uh, for the population. So that's it. Last one real quick. Thanks. Yeah, that's it for the initial talks. Uh, I will leave the floor for my colleagues, and I'm glad to go deeper in any of these topics for, for the discussion. Thank you, and sorry for exceeding a little bit. bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bernardo. Really appreciate the, the incredible work from um, Rio. Um, next, I'm going to pass it to um, Fanuel, um, the Director of Transport Development at in Dar es Salaam, or Dar. Yeah, thanks, Jacobo, and thanks, uh, the organizer, for this webinar. Uh, yes, my name has been introduced in Fanway. I work for the Rapid Transit. We are the government agency responsible for the establishment and the operation of the bus rapid transit in Dar es Salaam. Uh, a little bit of our background, uh, as you may be aware, like other uh, cities in Africa, uh, our city, Dar es Salaam, is one of the major uh, high populated cities in, in Tanzania, with more than 10% uh, uh, of the national population uh, living in Dar es Salaam. Uh, in the day, we have a population of around 7.2 plus million uh, residents in the city. But if you look on our public transport, is mainly dominated by the paratransit for many years, where it's been provided by the uh, Mini buses, we call them Daradala, but also we have the three wheelers, uh, or we call uh, Bajaj, and the two wheeler called uh, Boda Boda. So these are the main the public transport modes which we are using. But if you look at the, 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 the share uh, in terms of mode split, we have more than 45% 40, uh, of the residents depending on public transport. But we have another around 43 to 45, again, depending on uh, uh, NMTs. So there is a majority of residences who cannot, uh, uh, who depends, who are being close to these public transport needs. 
but we the government for many years have been investing in the road uh, infrastructure for vehicles not purely for public transport so if you look on the demand and supply uh, they are not balancing uh, and that resulted into a lot of uh, congestion into the roads there's a lot of emission because we are using uh, second hand buses imported from uh, japan most of them uh, and the road conditions are not that much good. Uh, and if you look on our public transport, I've got history back from uh, early, uh, during the colonial eras, where we used to have the uh, uh, company which was owned by the British uh, 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 Ellis, uh, administration. Uh, then later after, after, after the independence, we, it was taken over by the government, nationalized. And they dedicated a company for public transport in Dar es Salaam called Usafi Dar es Salaam. Unfortunately, due to the uh, rapid rapid urbanization, increase in population, uh, they, it could not cope with the needs. So in early 1983, the private sector started playing the, the part into provision of the public transport. That's where this minibus, the Daradara, uh, came in. And late in 20, 20, 2005, the border board, the three, uh, three wheelers and two wheelers started also complementing this other, 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 other modes. So the government looked, the situation was deteriorating as days, days in, days out. So they have to think what could be the solution to, to this. Just when they have to establish, uh, they decided to go for the public transport uh, by introducing the BRT, bus of transit. Uh, so the planning started in 2005, uh, where we did a number of studies. But in 2007, that's where our agency was established now to oversee the implementation of the project. So under this planning, we are we have planned to do the the BRT, the dedicated trunk uh, facilities or dedicated lanes, which comprise of 154.4 kilometers. So far, we have. Uh, finalizing construction of 20.29, which are operational, but we are now finalizing construction of another second corridor, which will be 20.3. And we have other two corridor, one of 20.23.6 and that of 30.1 uh, kilometer uh, construction is going on. And maybe next year we will also start construction of another corridor of 27 kilometers. So our ambition is to have all this uh, corridor, uh, the construction of which have uh, completed and they are for running by 2025, uh, 2026. Uh, with the current operation, uh, the, 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 we are using, we are having 210, uh, uh, 210 buses, uh, which we have a ridership of around 200 passengers a day. But we do believe if we have a, a, a full operation and we create the fleet uh, fleet size, we can go to the uh, ridership of five, uh, 450 uh, to 500 passenger a day. So what we have learned from this is uh, uh, first, our, our, the way we, we planned our network and our, our system is to make sure, uh, as you said, it's inclusive. We have to take care of all needs. We have to follow the universal, make sure there is universal accessibility. Can it be used by anybody, can it be easy accessed, but also uh, issue of gender. We need to look at the gender issues. We know we are we have been doing some study to see how the uh, GBV issues is in the, the system. And the, the, the situation is not good, especially with the paratransit. So we have to make sure that we improve into the new system, the BRT. But also uh, the, 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 the system is, as, as you know, the BRT, uh, uh, another part of the world, is an open uh, open system. So we have to make sure when a passenger can come in, board easier, get out and access their, their access. But to do the first, the last mile connectivity, we have also identified the network of the feeder lines uh, where we do the mixed, uh, in the mixed lane. But we are sharing with our colleague uh, from another agency called Tarura, which is the uh, rural and urban road uh, agents to make sure those networks are improved so the possibility can be good people can go in and get out. But also we are trying to link our, our BRT at much of the, the main uh, terminals with these other, other, other modes like the three-wheelers and two-wheelers so that they can feed into our system. 
So we are trying to make sure the system is integrated from these other modes so that the passenger can smoothly move from their home to the system, then to their workplace or to their destination without any challenges. Uh, as, uh, as, as, as you said, the issue was more the challenge. That's why we are doing the piecemeal because of the financing. Uh, government is responsible for doing the infrastructure and we are doing that through the, the, the uh, getting some grants and loans and from the national budget. Uh, but the operation aspect of this one, we need now to tap more on the private uh, uh, financing, funding, but also to get uh, uh, funding from the fair box uh, and the non-fair revenue tariff to make sure we support the operations. And that's where the, the main challenge is. It's easier to mobilize, the government easier to mobilize the, the, the resources for infrastructure, but when it comes to operation support, it's really, really uh, a challenge. And as we talk, we have not experienced a lot of uh, uh, a bit financing in terms of operation, but we see certain area where we, as we expand our network, we didn't need to pull out the, 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 so that we can have enough revenue to support the operations. Uh, so we have been trying to come up with the different uh, resources of revenue, uh, of, 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 of revenues, which are not fair, uh, uh, not, not, not a fair box so that we can support uh, those operations. Uh, and one of the area we are trying to, 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 to fast track or to look at is on uh, how could we use the TOD as one of the, the, the engine to support, uh, to support the operation of the DRT. So we are developing a number of uh, TOD guideline strategy along all our corridor and throughout the system to identify the potential nodes where we can develop around the station, put in some other businesses like real estate, uh, redevelopment, so that those financing come from those business can support also the operation. As we know, the, the, our, our, the fare is regulated by government, so there is no room like you can keep increasing the fare to, to, to cut for the operation cost. So that's Asana, an area we are trying to... Uh, yes? Sorry, I just wanted to, to have you wrap up. Sorry about that. Yes, I'm going there. So that's an area we are we are trying to push forward for that. At least we we we, we can support those. Uh, but in, in uh, uh, as the, the way forward, as I said, we, we we have been having a system which was not proper based on uh, regulations and the 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 the, 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 the legal, legal framework. So and we know the public transport is complex. It includes a number of uh, issues. You have to add these political issues, uh, economy, land use, and the other things. So we are, we are pushing at the strategic level to establish a, a registration, which will really focus on uh, urban mobility and create the, the legal framework and legal institutions to oversee the uh, public transport, not only in the restaurant, but with the other cities which are growing. But also uh, we make sure that there be a coordination between, uh, between many players. As we know, we have different uh, institutions, different agencies, working on this sector of power transport. So how should we be uh, properly coordinated so that we can deliver uh, uh, together on those areas? So I'll end up for now, but I'll be uh, happy to give more clarification if there's any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fenwa. Um, and next I'd like to pass it to, to Sanjay to discuss the perspective from Bhubaneswar. Thank you, Jacob. and. Uh... Uh, am I audible? My voice is clear. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And first of all, I will start uh, with my gratitude to ITDP for conferring Sustainable Transport Award Honorable Mention in the year 2023 to Capital Region Urban Transport. And uh, to start with, uh, in uh, the twin cities of Bhuneshwar and Katak, in the state of Odisha in India, the entire transport sector was completely unorganized and being operated by the private operators, with, which was in complete disarray. And uh, it was uh, also not affordable due to uncompetent fare structures. So in the year 2018, government of Odisha decided to establish CRUT and Capital Region Urban Transport was established in the May 2018 and its operation started in the year in November 2018 with 100, 150 buses. So initially, the, the, the operation was quite challenging because uh, 
the entire system was being managed by the private operators and uh, anyhow the we were able to run the system with our competent fare structures which was uh, quietly subsidized by government of government of odisha under housing and urban development department and uh, accordingly for uh, providing the seamless transport from 2018 onwards we started with 150 buses subsequently we had a um, during that initial phases uh, we are finding it very tough with our commuters and uh, we started with nearly 10000 commuters most of the buses were running empty and uh, everywhere the buses were being disrupted and stopped by the private operators so we took the, the with the support of the district administration and uh, the police administration we were able to manage to run the fleet and subsequently in the year 2019 our uh, commuters went up to nearly 1 lakh and then you all know in may 2019 we faced disastrous uh, cyclone fani in which uh, uh, in which it was devastating and uh, in that uh, our organization played an important role for supporting the distressed people and uh, we 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 used our bus stops the bus queue shelters the sophisticated bus queue shelters as uh, as the uh, distribution shop for the grocery and distribution of important uh, items to the to people and uh, our buses uh, were allowed free of cost to all the commuters during the pandemic and during uh, the cy cyclone funny so this was uh, well appreciated and uh, well taken up by the people of uh, the state and the commuters uh, increased subsequently to 2 lakhs with introduction of 200 more buses and now in 2023 we are having a fleet of 405 buses and recently during last year we have also introduced 50 e buses 50 electric buses were introduced with um, creation of uh, state of the art uh, depots bus depots and uh, uh, od terminals original destination terminals now in all we are having seven such depots and uh, three od terminals in the in the state and uh, Bhuvaneshwar is having, Bhuvaneshwar and Katak as a twin city is having a population of nearly 2.1 million and uh, it is in a, a spread in the area of nearly 1110 square kilometers. So this is the what uh, the, this uh, initiated about the existence of truth and uh, with the passage of time and increasing in the fleet, we thought of introducing gender uh, inclusivity in our system and uh, we decided uh, with 40 percent women conductors and i will here i will mention here that we are not calling them conductors we never call our drivers as drivers and conductors as conductors we call them captains and guides so this system we introduced in our uh, fleet of buses so that they also feel privileged uh, and then they also feel that we are also important part of the society. So the, the, we introduced 40 percent guides in our uh, fleet and uh, the women uh, guides were found more efficient than the comparison to the male guides uh, uh, for uh, revenue collection that is RCA part, revenue collecting agency part. And uh, now we have also um, going for the expansion of uh, our fleet uh, with uh, 200 e-buses have been sanctioned by the government. And today only we had a video conferencing with our government and government has approved that 200 buses and that will be most probably included in next six months to our fleet. And, and now we have started the capacity building program of uh, our, uh, uh, our uh, this thing, um, captains with introduction of women captains to drive the uh, e-buses. We have got uh, sophisticated uh, driving training institutes uh, in uh, our state uh, in, in, uh, in collaboration with OEMs, original equipment manufacturers like Tata and Ashok Leyland. And they are giving uh, uh, handy trainings to all our uh, uh, this, uh, guides and uh, even the uh, this thing, uh, drivers, that is uh, captains. So, this is all about the gender uh, gender inclusivity, and as uh, we all 
are speaking and we are discussing regarding the sustainability of the urban transportation any and all the stews for its survival are dependent on the government for funding as well as giving subsidies but uh, in our crut i am happy to inform you that uh, to have an resilient affordable and dependable and user friendly commuter ship in our uh, mo buses the subsidy which was being provided by the government uh, in the year 2018 during initiation initial period of its inception it was uh, 11.93 rupees per person subsidy now it has come down to 3.75 rupees in the year 2023 it was it was all due to increase in commuter ship which has now gone up to 4 lakhs in 405 buses that's why now government has already approved 550 more buses to be added to the fleet and this that those are going to be the e buses and uh, regarding the uh, and, and we are also having 50 e rickshaws uh, under somaka scheme given provided by gij for uh, the last mile connectivity but now we are thinking differently and recently myself and my md has been to barcelona uh, to attend the fira barcelona uh, uh summit on uh, uh, smart city expo world congress in that we we just think of something different instead of adding this uh, 500 e rickshaws or more e rickshaws to the fleet we are thinking of uh, integrating our system with rapido ola and uber the existing uh, system which is already functional so we we have already in discussion with them so we are uh, for uh, last mile connectivity we are going to use the existing service instead of giving more burdens on the road with more addition of new vehicles we can we can add them to our uh, functioning of uh, in the, in our uh, mobile app and uh, regarding uh, further expansion plan uh, uh, we have uh, already started capacity building of uh, our uh, captains in the state of art uh, training centers and uh, secondly uh, with addition of uh, more fleet of e buses we are going to replace all the diesel buses with e buses and we have already scrapped 68 e buses in last month so th so those were 8 years old buses so we are going to replace our entire mostly the entire fleet in katang katang and bhubaneswar by e buses for that we have started preparation tenders have been floated and uh, the creation of uh, e bus depot is under progress so this is all about uh, uh, the functioning of crut uh, in bhubaneswar and uh, katak city of odisha in india thank you thank you so much sanjay this is really interesting um and thank you to all three panelists so far Um so for the next phase of our our discussion I'm going to hand it over to some of our uh, research panel um to pose some of their questions to the three cities um for discussion. So I think first on the list is um Winnie Matula um who is going to discuss a little bit in more depth um about uh some of the challenges um especially from uh the uh the three focus points um uh equity um uh funding and resiliency thank you thank you very much uh, and thanks to all the presenters that was great i think when we look at these three key concepts that uh, uh public transport revolves around uh, in terms of equity resilience and funding the the critical thing that comes to mind is how do you ensure effective coordination and and kind of governance that makes you achieve what you want and as we have heard for example if you brazil is talking about fleet renewal issues of subsidy and how it's not enough and dar es salaam is about financing and how government can finance infrastructure but not operations so basically it's calling for going beyond relying on government one thing but then how do you rally all these other efforts what kind of governance is efficient that would make you achieve and fill the gaps whether is a gap of financing or a gap of fleet renewal uh, i think it it would be interesting to hear a little bit more on that because this really involves multi level governance 
you cannot do it like just a state and think you will go too far. So it would be interesting to hear what the, uh, those who are in practice and actually dealing with these issues at very practical level, like uh, Fanwell, uh, are doing about this to ensure that all those or, you know, actors are coordinated. For example, if you want to deal with a feeder, who is feeding into that BRT? Uh, are we picking the ones that have been, is it the two-wheeler, is it the, the, is it the, the, the dollar dollars? And how do you coordinate with them in terms of governance? Because again, as I've heard, when on their own, there is some level of inefficiency that the state may not think is viable. But how do you coordinate so that uh, the little that they offer, and they offer a lot, I think, the paratransits, for example, can can either be brought into the mainstream or even if they continue operating on a parallel line, uh, they are serving the city in an efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Um, and so I'll just pass it. Uh, anyone want to take a first pass at this? I think um, uh, Fanwell, uh, maybe you were you were <laughs> called on. Yes. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Winnie, for the good uh, question. It's true as 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 she have, uh, posed the issue of uh, governance. As I said, governance is critical for the public transport, uh, and given the fact that it involves different players at different angles and different levels. Uh, even if you look from our side, we have it's a national agency, but we are only limited in one city. There is another city to, to work on, and also we are looking at one model of public transport. So there is a lot of left behind which need to be brought into the, 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 the perspective. So what first needs to be done is to establish a clear mandate with legal, uh, with legal establishment. So make sure we, we need to make sure we have established mandate to whom should do what as regard to the, 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 the power transport is concerned. Uh, if the issue to do the regulation, regulatory have to be sure what the role it plays in responsibility. If it's an issue to do with the, the organizing of, of public transport in the city, it has to be left looking from the development perspective, not looking from the service perspective. So you have to look from the planning, the, 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 the implementation, and also some sort of, 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 of monitoring and regulation issues. So that's a key area. Establish clear mandate with legal basis. Second, we need to have a state of uh, uh, planning and readiness to transform. Because you find we don't have data, we, do, we are not informed with the, the proper, our, our, our policy are not informed with the, what the public needs vis-a-vis -vis what the, 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 uh, the government is providing. So if you don't have a state of planning to the city, which is ready to take over this kind of planning and this kind of, of systems, it may be not uh, working properly. But also look at the institutional arrangement, where that this uh, issue of public transport should sit. Should sit at the city level, should be sitting at which if there's a ministry, which means should take care of this one. For example, for us, uh, we are working from the president office regional administration of government, because this is more looking at the local government issues uh, and administrative issues. But there's a policy system, the, the, the means of, of, of transport. So we have this institutional arrangement which are not properly uh, well coordinated. But so you need to look at that one, make sure it's efficient and the civil responsibilities are seems. Uh, 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 attended from one institution to another. And that's where the, the, the key issue of uh, coordination uh, plays loss. So for, for, for me, but also the, she brought in the good 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 issue of uh, do we, should we leave out the paratransit? I do believe the transport industry engagement is key. We need to make sure all the players, all the structure, which are formal and informal, are really uh, brought into the table to discuss the issues. And we all have buy-in in what we are doing because we still need to support each other. There is some areas where they, they, like our BRT cannot go, but the paratransit that are going. But how do, if we have to transform, if we don't have to do it, how do we bring the, like, the fair correction system, which can be used by anybody uh, from different modes? So the, 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 the engagement of the transport sector is also key if we really have to address these issues and make sure that there is proper coordination and good governance. I can end up for now on this. Thank you so much, Fanwell. Um, maybe we have time for one other person, and and I'm going to have to uh, be a little bit more uh, uh, aggressive in in keeping your comments short, just so we can hear from different uh, different questions. And I know there's been really a good engagement in the chat. So, anyone else, Sanjay Bernardo, respond to the question of governance briefly? If not, we can move on. Okay, Bernardo. 
Yeah, just quickly, I think the the main the main point was raised by Fanwa. We have a problem about regulation. If we have uh, contracts where the operator are only remunerated by the fare collection and they are competing for the fare, we won't have the the this this integration between the different modes, even if we have capacity of planning and we have capacity to monitor the uh, any capacity to monitor the, the operation. So a um, very important point that we, we faced here is to have to try to put all the players, all the operator, uh, following somehow the same rules and, and having a, a clear uh, remuneration scheme that do not incent do not give incentives for the competition, but for the, the, the integration. And for that point, it's really important to have the control of the fair collection system and also have a clear remuneration scheme that is going in that direction. Great, thank you so much. So a clear clear sense of responsibilities, uh, clear, who, clear about who controls the revenue, the government should control the revenue or, or not the operators and clarity about roles. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to pass it to um, uh, Gina uh, for the next question. And Gina, if you could direct your question directly to uh, the the city that you want to uh, respond to it. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, three fascinating studies. Um, but I would like to go to uh, Bhubaneswar uh, and Sanjay because the, the discussion on, on women drivers is fascinating. Having done some work on this um, in, a, in a butcher and uh, uh, Cape Town and seeing how difficult it is to, uh, to retain women drivers. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about how, how the idea came to you and you know what's the vision of bringing in um, these women? Will they be respected? Um, you know, how did you recruit and, and what is the retention so far? Thank you for the question. And uh, I will start uh, with uh, the women drivers. Women drivers will not call drivers. They are the captains. So first of all, they are the captains. And uh, and uh, we first, uh, we this idea came to us uh, during introduction of those e-rickshaws uh, after pandemic when a uh, lot of people were finding life difficult to survive. Then we got 50 e-rickshaws from GI Jet and there uh, the idea stuck to us. Ki why don't we engage uh, transgenders, women drive, women captains or sarathis and the HIV positive uh, people to drive our these 50 e-rickshaws. So the idea stuck from that, that point and again we, we just uh, took a help of the of an NGO called Aruna, which is working in Bhuvaneshwar and Katak. And uh, they helped us in getting these uh, distressed people from different parts of the city. And they were just introduced, they were brought to our uh, organization. And then we tried to just console them, we tried to motivate them. And most of them, they were telling ki it will be difficult for a woman uh, Sarathi or the women to drive a e-rickshaw in the city and the city is so congested, there is huge traffic. We just uh, took them to our confidence and then we, we, we admitted, we got them admitted in our uh, driving training institutes. So for few, one, for few days, uh, they were not able to adjust uh, themselves in that driving atmosphere with the gents uh, who were there. So mostly the gents were the drivers who were being trained at HMB drive all, in all the driving training institute. So they are fi finding difficult to cope up with in competition with, the, with those gent drivers. But subsequently, with motivation and uh, with get with uh, giving them confidence, they started driving. And you will be surprised. Now all our fifty e-rickshaws in the city are being driven by the women sarthis. Women sarthis, transgenders, and uh, even HIV positive people, and they are doing it so nicely, and they are loved by each and every part of the commuters who are using this e rides. We are called, we are calling them e rides. So they are running in different parts of the city just for last mile connectivity from our uh, 
uh, from our bus stops to either their place of work or, or residence. And uh, encouraged with this, uh, we thought of adding women uh, captains to even buses. So again, we, these 50 Sarthis, they were selected and they were again uh, shifted to this uh, HMB Driving Institute for a month long training. Because in our state in India, you need one month training in any recognized driving training institute to get a heavy motor vehicle license. That is a complete residential training. You have to stay one month in that institute and get the subsequently the license. So they, those 50 e-ride Sarathis who are having a light motor vehicle license were then admitted again to the institute. They upgraded to HMV. Now we have got 50 HMV drivers of the captains who are ready to drive the e-buses. So, and, and, and they, are, they are again with us, they are under the phase of training and we have already, uh, we have got 50 e-buses and two buses have been kept exclusively for training of this uh, uh, 50 uh, women uh, drivers of the captains and they are being regularly trained and after introduction of these buses in next six months, so these 50 will be our first women riders or women drivers to drive e-buses. Thank you so much, Sanjay. This is really interesting um, perspective on on bringing in more e-buses. It sounds like yeah, women e-bus drivers. It sounds like we're still in the early process for the e-bus drivers, but that the the e-rickshaw drivers have been successful so far in in retaining them. Um, so, just in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it on to Ricardo Gisson, a uh, transport expert. Um, to pose uh, his question. And again, if you could direct it at um, a specific panelist, that would be very helpful. Thanks, Ricardo. Okay, Jacob, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Bernardo, maybe if you can talk a little bit more about how the systems are ensuring that they are providing a good level of service to users and how are they monitoring this? I, I think it's what are, how to ensure that the people who are using public transport are not using it just because they don't have another option. So I, I, I think in the long run it will be very important for any system to ensure that users are choosing uh, public transport, not because they don't have other options. And and, and the other thing that uh, struck me is how you uh, or how it's the city of Rio uh, doing the maintenance of the um, the infrastructure because you said well we are refurbished that but who are, who are going to take care of this uh, in the in the day to day basis I, I think if you can comment on those things it will be very interesting thank you great thank you Ricardo so uh, the first thing was to to somehow to, we needed to to modernize and digitalize all the data that we had in, in the in the city uh, town how to to work on on transport so when when uh, we, we we start working in 2021 we didn't have the stop the bus stops mapped um, in the city and it took us like six, six months to do that with with a small team from from the the the, the city and it, and it, this is really strategic to have the data and the, the way the digital digitalize the data to be able to monitor the service um, quality right so this is this was one of our first biggest challenge is what it, it was to to know where where the problems uh, we 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 knew that a lot of neighborhood didn't have uh, uh, any transport services, but we didn't knew where where was the the priority. So uh, the first effort was to digitalize all the data and and to create ways to monitor it in 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 real time. So uh, when, once we have all the planning uh, digitalized, we were able to look at the GPS to look at how uh, the, the operation was, was uh, performing. And one of our um, main uh, success story uh, uh, it was the BRT uh, because it provided the quality that people uh, did lose during the pandemic. So we had a, a very bright, vibrant system um, uh, before the pandemic, uh, and it was declining, but was still the backbone of the, all the, the, the transportation in the city. 
and it it was left over uh, from um, the 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 last administration that didn't um, look at the the challenge of maintaining the operation and the main problem was again the governance and also the regulation the remuneration of of the the system that was only based on fare so what we are looking right now we we, we did at this moment was to subsidize the system and also to pro, to have private operator coming in with new rules so the the, the remuneration the future remuneration of the beer system, system will not uh, be based on fare collection but on kilometers uh, covered on uh, on a level of service that they have to provide and not only on uh, what they are able to collect from user and the maintenance is something that we are still uh, struggling with here in, in Rio we had now the the, the municipal administration jumping in and and maintaining all this all the the station and this is something that we should uh, look at how we can uh, have a very clear rule for a private operator uh, participating in this cost uh, of maintenance as well. Thank you so much, Bernardo. So having clear sources of, of funding for operations and maintenance is incredibly important. Um, so I want to pass it now to the last uh, researcher pose the final question. So Gift, um, I'll pass it over to you to uh, briefly ask the last question. And again, if you could direct it at a specific panelist, that would be very helpful. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Jacob. And uh, I would like to uh, direct my question to uh, Fano, uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Uh, we all know that public transport plays a vital role in providing access to services, jobs, education, healthcare, and many other um, uh, amenities. Uh, but we also do know that there are so many uh, barriers to this, uh, physical, financial, and other bar barriers. And especially in South Africa, uh, this can lead to differences in assets that not everyone has the same uh, assets. In other words, the assets is, is unequal. And it can be associated with people uh, economic ability of being able to pay or social in terms of um, a, a caregiving matter or a school going to care or environmental in terms of where you live within the urban environments. So these disadvantages can play out in terms of how people access uh, uh, public transport. Uh, and a number of um, uh, issues has been raised in terms of how to enhance public transport, how to integrate uh, technology into public transport. So my question is, for instance, what specific actions can be taken to ensure equitable access when promoting, for instance, uh, sustainable transport options or when integrating technology into uh, public transport? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gift, for for good question on the accessibility and equitability uh, to public transport. Yes, uh, as I said from the beginning, when we designed our system, we looked from those you know, to make sure that it's inclusion and it uh, take needs of different groups. So uh, to make sure that this uh, issue of equitability is 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 enhanced, we need to understand the willingness to pay uh, of our user what the affordability is. So we look on those and make sure we determine that, that if it's fair, it's a fair which is affordable to all the groups. And that's what we take to the government to decide their poll. And unfortunately, we, uh, the good thing we don't decide as the agents, the public transport agents, but we have a regulator who have to determine what should be uh, the fair uh, to the, these services. But we know there is groups, uh, different groups, which needs different treatment, uh, especially like for the, the students. We know during the peak hours, they, there's some kind of scrambling to get them into the bath. They have to be uh, at school on time. So we have came up with some, some kind of action where we have dedicated buses during the peak hours for students, where the student is only for student and we're putting the, the, all the uncle and the student to make sure they look at the student in the bus they are not uh, brought to each other. But we give only those services during the peak hours to make sure they go to school on time 
uh, and they don't uh, get late, late to go back to, to, to home. For the other groups, we have take, uh, put some mechanism on the stations, as well as the bigger terminals, to make sure there is a priority lanes for boarding, where we know there is those need groups which cannot, uh, if there's some kind of, some tough of, 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 of scrambling, there is some people to take them to the specific uh, priority lanes to get in the bus in time, and they have the, the specific seats for them. So we are trying to make sure that everyone is getting uh, treatment equal at, from at the BRT operation. But also uh, looking to the, the other areas, just where we say the, 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 the my, 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 uh, last mile connectivity, we are trying to promote these uh, the other modes which are doing those uh, last mile connectivities. Uh, we had the project we are uh, under Solution Plus to promote the e, 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 E3 wheelers to make sure they can do those last mile connectivity uh, with the good uh, options for our, our, our passenger to go to their, to access the, the BRT from their home to the, the, the stations. So those are kind of the, 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 the action we are trying to put forward to make sure that everyone can go into our system and get out. But also at the, at the station, we have some people, we, are, we have recruited some, some, some people to take care of those uh, people, the disabled and physical challenged people so that they can be helped to get to the bus, to get out of the station. Uh, if they're starting to cross, they can be uh, properly guided. So we are trying to make sure we take care of each uh, and everybody at the station into the system. Thank you thank so you. much, Fanuel, and thank you for the, the question, uh, Ricardo. Um, so now we're gonna move, we're just about at time. So I wanted to give each of the three panelists one final closing call to action. So a couple of sentences, of based on this discussion, what we need to do, what can we go, uh, where can we go from here? Um, and so very brief, just a couple of sentences. So we'll think about what's most important and uh, and go for it. So I'll start with you, Sanjay, if you can just do a couple of sentences, a call to action for the group about what we need to do next. Okay, Sanjay. Thank you, Jacob. Uh... As per our experience uh, in the operation of uh, uh, buses in uh, in our uh, urban areas of uh, twin cities of Katak and Bhubaneswar, we started. Now we are with an affordable, depend, affordable, dependable, and commuter-friendly bus service. This is our motto, and our next big aim is to reduce the subsidy amount which you are getting from the government because we need to be sustainable. So sustainability is a major factor of uh, every urban transport for its survival. And, uh, and now with introduction of e-buses and uh, as a women, uh, women drivers, this women captains. So we think uh, uh, of expansion of our uh, services even to other parts of the state now we have uh, started in Raulkela, Sambalpur and uh, even in Barampur. These are the three other municipal corporations in the state of Odisha. So now we are in the process of expansion and we think that uh, with these efforts uh, we are we will be able to provide a sustainable and user-friendly uh, bus service to each and every commuters. Thank you so much Sanjay. Um, so affordable, dependable and sustainable service uh, that includes uh, gender. Um, Bernardo, I'm passing it to you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I think I, I will end with uh, that public essential services cannot follow restrictive private remuneration scheme based only on fare. And this is something that we are starting to do in Brazil since the pandemic, and it requires uh, multiple level government engagement and participation and also coordination to have uh, uh, dedicated reliant revenue streams to ensure uh, service quality. Thank you so I'm much, Leonardo. Uh, so having dedicated government funding for public transport services, not just relying on fares for services is really key. Um, Manuel, I'll pass it to you for a final brief remark. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for me, what I can say, uh, we public and private uh, sector partnership is key if you have to have an enhanced financial sustainability and the commercial variability for the uh, public transport operations. But we need to get the finance right. 
And to be right, it has to be operational centered structure, uh, which not look more infrastructure and we forget the operation aspect of the systems. And that's where the, the key area we need to look at. That will enable us to come with innovative uh, 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 financing mechanism that can also look not only the infrastructure, but also look take care of the operation aspect of the system. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we need to, uh, we have to have, include the private sector, but they need to, we need to be structured very carefully so that it uh, works well and be focused on operations. Thank you so much to panelists. Also want to point out there's been really great discussion in the chat. Um, uh, and great q and A. I I think we addressed uh, most of the questions. Maybe one final question that wasn't addressed for people to think about was the relationship um, with uh, existing car use and existing incentives for car use, such as um, the provision of free parking or, or uh, cheap licenses or the provision of road space. So maybe something for a future discussion to think about. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone and pass it back to Ivona. Great, thank you so much for these rich discussions. I really thank you for your time spent with us, um, panelists, researchers, and you, the, the audience, of course. I just wanted to share special thank yous for Jacob, for Henrik, for Bernardo, Fanuel, Sanjay, Gift, Gina, Ricardo, and Winnie. Hope to see you next. Please be on the lookout for the uh, recordings and later on with the paper. Uh, we took a note of everyone's comments. They are really helpful. And also this will help us to plot future webinars and future um, best practices that we want to bring to you. So with that, I really want to thank the organizers, VRF, and again, thank you um, and see you again soon. Bye everyone. Thank you and bye everyone. Bye thank you. and thank you, Ivona. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much for the arrangement. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> from, from VRF, we really want to thank ITDP. Thank so much for the co cooperation on on Mobilize Learning Lab, um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, the VRF staff members for working hard on this uh, since uh, early 2023. It's been a terrific journey, and thanks to all of you for contributing. And looking forward to see you again. Yes, very much. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, everyone. We'll definitely follow up and 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 keep everyone in the loop. Um, take care, everyone. Good seeing you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.